Hey everyone, Darren Voros here. Today I want to walk you through part two of how to legally convert a single family dwelling to a two unit dwelling, or in other words, converting a single family dwelling and adding a secondary suite. If you haven't seen part one of the video, I'll link it right here. And that really gets into the benefits and drawbacks of legalizing suites, the zoning requirements, the application process, and much more. But today I want to talk about the actual construction elements involved with creating a legal secondary suite. Because if you know what's required from a construction perspective when you go in and look at properties, you'll have a better idea of what will work and what will be too much of a headache for you. Before we get into today's video, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. If you don't mind, hit that like button as well. That really helps out me and my channel. And it also helps the YouTube algorithm place this video in front of the right audience. And now without further ado, let's get into it. The first thing I want to do is put out a bit of a disclaimer because every municipality in North America will have slightly different rules and regulations. Today I'm just talking general guidelines based on my experience. So if you're ever in doubt, check with your local building department or building inspector to find out what rules and regulations are going to be applicable to you in your situation. The majority of the rules and regulations I'll go through in this video all have to do with fire safety, which is the number one priority of most building codes. Fire safety is so important when it comes to tenants as it protects them and it protects you as an owner. So that's why there's so much onus put on fire protection when it comes to legal secondary suites. The first thing you should consider when looking at a potential secondary suite is the room sizes and the ceiling height. Room size is pretty straightforward. Obviously you can't have a bedroom in a closet unless you're Harry Potter and you need to have a bathroom in every single suite. An outhouse just won't do. Do. Ah, so sorry. Ceiling heights are also pretty straightforward and an easy one to figure out. I always take a tape measure with me when I tour houses to see if the basement meets the minimum height requirement. In most municipalities, you're going to be looking at a minimum ceiling height of around 6 foot 8 or 80 inches. And if you prefer to work in the metric system, you're looking at around 2 meters. Most building codes will say that you have to maintain that ceiling height across 75% of the apartment. You can have ductwork or bulkheads reducing the height, but there are restrictions on those reductions being on an escape route. There are window requirements for all secondary suites as well. Windows are generally not required though in laundry areas, kitchens, and bathrooms. On the flip side of that, windows are generally required in bedrooms and living rooms. And I'll get into egress windows specifically a little bit later on in this video. There are door requirements to secondary suites as well. Entrance doors to suites and any door to the exterior generally needs to be a 32 by 78 inch door. In my experience, bedroom doors are required to be at least 30 inches wide. And for easy figuring, if you have 30 inch doors throughout, other than your entrance to your suite and your exterior door, you should be fine. Smoke alarms. Smoke alarms are generally required within each unit, hallways serving bedrooms, in each bedroom, and every shared means of egress. Depending on the municipality, in some cases, they'll allow older homes to be interconnected wirelessly or have battery operated smoke detectors. But in most cases, they'll need to be hardwired and interconnected. And in a lot of current building codes, the need for a strobe light also accompanies the need for a smoke detector. Carbon monoxide alarms are required when a fuel burning appliance is located within a suite or there's an attached garage. CO2 alarms must be installed adjacent to all sleeping areas. In older retrofit homes, sometimes they will allow for them to be battery operated or plugged into an electrical outlet, but in newer construction, they'll need to be mechanically fastened, hardwired, and interconnected within the suite. The good news is there are products on the market that combine a smoke detector, CO2 detector, and they also have a strobe light built in. The bad news is they're like $10,000. Okay, they're not 10,000, but they're about 200 bucks a piece. So make sure you're budgeting for that when you're putting these into your rental suites. Fire and sound separations. An easy rule of thumb is on any ceilings or walls between units, you'll need to have at a minimum drywall. No drop ceilings are allowed. Depending on the municipality and the building code, you'll have to check whether or not they will allow half inch drywall or whether 5 8 type X fire weighted drywall is required. Some building codes will have requirements around sound transfer in your fire separations as well. And they'll have what's called an STC rating. An STC rating is a sound transmission class rating. So again, in order to confirm whether your fire separations require an STC rating, check with your local building department or your building inspector. Here's a little tip. Even if it's not a requirement, I would suggest installing a fire and sound rated insulation in all shared walls and ceilings and adding a resilient channel to hang the drywall from. The resilient channel floats the drywall off the structure, which allows for less sound transfer. Another requirement that's often overlooked is that utility rooms that contain a fuel burning appliance, such as a furnace or a boiler, need to be fire rated as well. 
This means that you'll have to have drywall on all the walls and ceilings, which can be a huge pain in the butt. So if this is the case, I try to drywall as soon as possible and have your trades work around your drywall as opposed to the other way around. Fire rated doors with self-closing hinges are usually required for any entrance doors located off of common areas. Hey everybody, sorry to interrupt the video. We'll get back to it in just a second, but I wanted to add one additional item that I forgot to mention in part one of this series. And that is talking about parking regulations when it comes to adding secondary suites. And I can't believe I forgot to talk about parking on part one of this series because it's literally the bane of my existence on most of my secondary suite conversions. Each municipality has slightly different regulations when it comes to parking. So you really want to read your zoning bylaws to make sure you fully understand the parking regulations. So for instance, in Red Deer, Alberta, the bylaw states that in your secondary suite, if it's a two bedroom unit or less, you only need to add one additional parking spot. If in your secondary suites you have two bedrooms or more, you need two additional parking spots in addition to your regular parking requirements for the single family dwelling. So what that means is if you have a three bedroom unit upstairs, for instance, and you added a three bedroom unit in the basement, you need to have four parking spots on that property. And that may eliminate a lot of properties that you're looking at. In contrast, in the city of Toronto, for instance, a secondary suite that's located in an R zone does not require an additional parking space. And in Hamilton, Ontario, you'd need one parking space for each dwelling unit. So as you can see, depending on your municipality, it can really vary as to what the parking requirements are. Another item that can affect your parking situation is whether or not your municipality allows for tandem parking, parking one vehicle in front of the other. Some municipalities allow it, some municipalities don't. So you'll wanna check that out as well. So take some time, look at the parking regulations along with your zoning regulations to make sure that the properties you're interested in meet all of the zoning requirements and all of the parking requirements. I'd also like to say thank you to Sheehan2k2 who brought this up in the comments section of one of my videos. And this is why I think the comments section can be so valuable because I can either answer your question in the comments section itself or I can address it on a future video. So thanks so much for leaving those comments and questions for me. And now back to your regular scheduled video. Heating systems. This is where I see a lot of variance between different municipalities and different building codes. For instance, my properties with secondary suites in Red Deer, Alberta require that the secondary suite has its own dedicated heating system. On the contrary, here in Toronto, if you're retrofitting a home, a second heat system for a secondary suite is not a requirement. The Ontario Building Code states that the principal and second dwelling units may share a heating and cooling system provided a smoke detector is installed in the supply or return air duct that would turn off the fuel supply and electrical power to the heating system when activated. In my experience, the cost to install a system like this is somewhere between $150 and $300, which is very different than the cost to put in a secondary heating system. Again, each municipality is gonna be slightly different, but in some cases, fire dampers are gonna be necessary for ductwork that spans more than one suite, and in some municipalities, that's not a requirement at all. In addition to that, if you're using something like a ductless split or baseboard heaters or radiant heat, you'll often be required to install an HRV or an ERV to bring in fresh air from the exterior and circulate it within the unit. Plumbing, a good rule of thumb is that backflow prevention will be required on basement plumbing fixtures, which means that each fixture in the basement will require separate backflow prevention or a series of fixtures can be protected by one single backflow valve. It's also a requirement that the main floor unit and basement unit's plumbing systems have to connect after the backflow prevention is in place. So that if there was a backup on the main line and the upstairs tenants kept flushing their toilet and the basement tenant wasn't home for a while, you would have a really shitty situation to come home to, pun intended. Electrical. There are no special electrical requirements for the most part, except that the new suite will need to meet the current electrical code. Electrical does not need to be separated. For instance, each suite does not require its own electrical panel, but I do find that it's helpful if the electrical is separated out between one suite and another. This way, if each suite has its own electrical panel, you can put that on a separate meter and the tenants can pay for their own electricity. If it's at all possible, I would also make sure that the electrical panel for the suite is located inside of that suite. That way, if you have something like a simple tripped breaker, you don't have to go down into the other suite to be able to reset that breaker and disturb that tenant. And last but not least, egress. In most new construction, it's a requirement that you must have a dedicated exit, not shared with any other unit without having to go up or down more than one floor. If you have a shared exit, it must have a fire resistance rating of 45 minutes for a one-story unit or one hour for a two-story unit and it also must have a second and separate exit door. And for clarification, because I've run into this before, an egress window is not considered an acceptable secondary exit. Also, if the exit door from a unit is not at the same floor level as the bedroom, an egress window is also required that is openable from the inside without tools, 
provides an individual unobstructed open portion having a minimum area of 3.8 square feet with no dimension less than 15 inches and does not require additional support to keep it open and except for basement windows has a maximum sill height of one meter. Did you get all that? In some retrofit applications, a shared exit will be allowed with a fire resistance rating of 30 minutes and as long as smoke alarms in both units and common areas are interconnected and if the bedroom is not at the same level, you need to provide an egress window. Having said that, an egress window is not required where a door on the same floor level as the unit provides direct and separate access to the exterior. So as you can see, there are many things that you'll wanna consider when you're looking at adding a secondary suite to a potential property from a construction perspective. If you guys enjoyed today's video, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. With that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.